morning. Amen. There we go. There we go. You already started, man. That's what I like to see. That's what I like to see. All right. So what we're going to try and do, my daughter said, Dad, you got a tablet. You ought to try to use it. Whatever. Whatever, girl. Whatever. Whatever. So I'm going to try it, but I'm already mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't going to work very well. All right, first of all, we got, um, we're trying to raise money. And Mike told me that I think we have money for one more month and we're closing out. So that's a good thing, right? And so um, our goal is to get four more months so that we finish out through our physical year, which would be May. And um, um, our, 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 our long-term plan is that we hope, we're hoping that, as the, the neighborhood around us grows, and we're already seeing that, people find hope, find, find out about the message, start to roll in. You know what I mean? And so um, the first year was thin. Plus we had the, the heating unit roll out and that kind of thing. Um, but it's starting to pick up. And so that's God is good, right? Right? Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Thick or thin? Let's see if my things are work. It's going to actually work, I think. All right, so what we're doing is a series on the God I never knew. And me and Mike have been talking about this for a while and uh, thinking about what would happen if uh, my, my complaint has been that um, since I've been at Hope, I've been able to marry some people, and they want to use um, 1 Corinthians 13 as the prescription for how they should treat each other. And while I'm the, while I'm the, the facilitator, the elder facilitating the wedding, in my head, I am keep thinking, have you read that 13? Have any of you guys read that? <laughs> I'm married 30 years. Have you read it, Brett? <laughs> Have you read it? Can you do it? And I keep thinking, you don't really want to you really don't want to use this passage as your, your commitment to your wife. It would be a mistake. <laughs> or your husband, right? So so me and Mike have been talking, and I'm thinking, so I read this passage. <laughs> Let me read it to you. Now, I, I want you to put your best behavior on, your best husband and wife behavior on, and I just want to see if you can measure up. Because if you can measure up, I'm done. I won't even preach. I'll just let you come up and tell us how to do it. Okay? So I'll start with verse 4. It actually starts in verse, verse uh, ver actually the end of 12, 31, but what Mike and I are preaching through. Let me read this. Now, just listen to this. Love is patient, love is kind. I already checked out half of y'all. <laughs> okay? Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Guess I'm gone. Love is not proud. I'm definitely out now. Love is not rude. Uh, Randy, listen. <laughs> <laughs> love, love, uh, it is not self-seeking it is not easily angered where's Mark at where's Mark at with all them guns man where you at Mark it keeps no record of wrong love does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth it always protects Always trust, always hopes, always persevere. Love never fails. How many of you still with me? See, I, I know like about two, uh, a third in, y'all checked out. Because some of you have been married longer than me and my wife, and you know. So, I, so I'm thinking about this, and I say to Mike, Mike, this, is, this ain't prescription, is it? This is the medicine I'm going to give to Earl. 
and Veronica. This isn't the medicine I'm giving to you two. This is a description. It's not a prescription. It's a description of love, right? So my simple idea is this. Today, we're going to look. I know it says we're supposed to look at a couple different things, but I was having a little bit of a headache trying to figure this out. So what we're going to look at today, I'm going to do, we're going to review love is patient, love is kind, and it doesn't envy. And then today I'm going to focus in on what it means and, and why in the world Paul decides to say it does not boast. It is not proud. I know I was supposed to do rude, self-seeking, and not easily angry, but that's a mouthful. But we'll see what we can get done. My premise is this. That the Father's love has the capacity to subdue the pride in all of us. And if love subdues pride, it doesn't mean that it stamps it out. But if love slowly subdues pride, then our need to boast goes away. Our need to boast goes away. Our need to boast goes away. Let me, let me read you a, a story. There's a story in Grand Rapids. An owner of a small foreign car had begun to irritate his friends by bragging incessantly about his gas mileage. So they, his friends, decided they would get some humor out of this guy's tireless boasting, as well as maybe bring an end to it. Every day, one of them would sneak to his parking spot, where the man kept his car, and pour a few more gallons into his gas tank. Soon the bragger, was recording absolutely phenomenal mileage. <laughs> he was boasting about getting as much as 90 miles to the gallon. And then the pranksters, those pranksters, they took secret delight in his exasperation as he tried to convince people that he wasn't lying. It was even more fun to watch his reaction when they stopped filling the tank. And the poor cat couldn't figure out what happened to his mileage in his car, right? <laughs> boasting. See, my sense is this. Boasting is, is, the, is the symptom of pride. Boasting is the symptom of pride. Boasting is, and I'll talk about what I think that is, but let me, let me uh, look at the scriptures. We're looking at boasting and pride in the context of a relationship with the Father who's love. Let me read what Jesus says, because Jesus is the reflection of the Father in the New Covenant that describes love. And in Matthew, write that down, because I'm, I'm, I'm living, I'm remembering Nate Kittleson. Some of you remember Nate dearly. And Nate said, JC, you put too much stuff in your handout. I said, what you mean? He said, man, you got to leave room for us to write, man. Like, like, don't tell us everything. Just put a couple few things down and then leave a lot of space. So when I was preaching today, when I was putting the, the handout together this morning, I thought of Nate, and I was going to fill it up with all my scriptures. And I, I said, no, nah, Nate, I got you, dude. I hear you. So fill it in yourself. <laughs> Be like Nate said. So the first passage I'm going to read from you so you can get the reference and look it up yourself. It's from Matthew 11, and I'm going to read 28 through the end of the chapter. Matthew 11, 28. Jesus said to them, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, what happens is when you 
connect yourself with the Father who's loving and patient and kind. You connect yourself to a yoke that's light. You connect yourself also, though, to something that you can't boast about. You, you connect yourself to a father who loves you. Here's what happens. Without love, what Paul's saying is that you could have gifts, talents, riches, money, wealth, whatever. But without love, we, we live agitated. We live something missing. I was in Barnes and Nobles last night trying to get a word from the Lord early because you know how I do. Like, actually started on Monday, started reading, nothing. Tuesday, nothing. Wednesday, I'm looking at the Lord like, Lou, you got to give me something here, really, come on. So last, yesterday, I said, I'm not going to be up to 2 o'clock like I always am. I'm going to get on it early, man. I'm going to go to Barnes and Nobles and open my Bible. And I opened my Bible. Nothing. I'm reading the passage. And here's my question. Paul says, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not proud. Can you answer me the question, Randy? What does boasting and proud have to do with love? What does it have to do with love? Why did he have to say that? That was my first question, so it starts rolling. The problem is, I sit in Barnes & Noble for three hours, nothing. Just like it always does, 11.30, my brain opens up, bing, 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 and I start thinking. What I realize is this, without the Father's love, we are doomed to live a life agitated and restless without rest. But a matter of fact, with God's love on this side of heaven, we still live agitated and restless. And some of us confuse agitation, restless intention with the absence of the Father. And what I want to proclaim to you is that if God is in fact patient and kind, and if in fact he loves the truth, and in fact he trusts and he protects and he hopes and he perseveres, even in the face of tension, even in the face of agitation, even in the face of pride, even, in the, in, even after the action of bragging, God still got it. And so let's take a look at it. I want to look at Paul's writing. Paul's, Paul's writing, and he's making a connection, and me and Mike make this connection, right? So we say, the Bible says in John 4, John 4, the Bible says something that's really interesting. It says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how he showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that he might through him, uh, that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice. So the premise is based on this notion that if God is love and Paul's writing about love, and he's describing the, the character of love and the action of love, then Paul's also describing the Father. And if he's describing the Father, then let's take a look just briefly in terms of review as to what Paul says. Mike talked earlier, and he talked about the fact that Paul describes God as patient. Now, my problem was when Mike preached that sermon, I came late. I didn't hear the description of 
patient and kind. I went online and listened to it. But the way I have to do things is I listen to Mike, and if I memorize it the way Mike does, then it doesn't become mine. So I had to go find my own way around it. But what Mike described very well is that God is patient, and the notion for patience is long-suffering. Let me read you the definition I found. The father, I want you to think about this. The father can endure evil, injury, provocation without being filled with resentment, indignation, or revenge. The father, because he loves, he keeps his mind firm and gives, and that gives him power over the angry passion, furnishes it with persevering patience that shall rather wait and wish for a reformation than fly off in resentment. The father's love can put up with many slights and neglects from the person he loves and wait long to see the kindly effects of patience. That's long-suffering. Then I looked up kind and I landed on a definition that I liked for the father. Think about this now. Our dad in heaven is benign and bountiful, courteous and obliging. The law of kindness is on his lips. His heart is large and his hands are open. He is ready to show favor and to do good. He seeks to be useful, not only seizes on opportunities of doing good, but searches them out for us. This is his general character. He is patient under injury and apt to use his power to bring about good in all things. Kind. I'm thinking about that. I'm like, wow. The father is patient, long-suffering. That way? Do you believe it? How many of you believe that? This is where you talk to me. This is where you nod your head or something. This is where you don't give me that South Dakota stare. All right. Yes, Pastor. No, no. <laughs> Not Master. That's him, dude. I, I, I just, I, pa Pastor, I just need to know you out here, man. I look, I look out sometimes when, I've, when I come to Hope, I look and I see people like. Now, when I'm in the courtroom, I like that. I like that. If I'm testifying, I want everybody to go to sleep while I'm not asking any questions. But in here, I want you to be awake. I ask you again. A patient father? You believe it? That he's patient with you? Long suffering. Can you believe the kindness I just described? Okay. I found this picture. I don't know if this is going to work. You got to push it forward for me. So the picture of the picture of the father becomes the person of Christ. And Christ describes himself. His impact on John, his impact on Paul, his impact on all the writers in the, in the book is to show that the father's faith is passionately in love with us. And this is a picture before Jesus in the Passion. Anybody seen the Passion for Christ? This is a picture before he's getting ready to go. I, I particularly like this picture a little better. I was trying to find, to give you an image without words, the Father. Now, here's an important piece. That guy right there, bad picture of God, but a nice picture of the moon. That's the father, that's you. That's the father, that's me. Now what Paul's going to say next is he's not envious. I think it's true. God is too great to be envious. There's nothing out there that he wants. 
Accept us. Accept us. And he wants a relationship with us. I think the envy Paul's describing is not God's character, but what he's trying to sort out is in the Corinthian church, they call themselves loving people. But their love was possessive, divisive, separatist, or haunting, arrogant, and conceited. So Paul is trying to describe what love is and what it does and what love isn't and what it doesn't do. Mike aptly described the notion of envy last week. What I want to do today, I read from John the Apostle. What I want to do today is contrast God's patience and his kindness with this notion of boastful and proud. The word for pride was interesting. The word for pride in this, or the word for boastful, when it says God is not boastful, God doesn't boast and he's not pride. The word for boastful is to vault yourself up. Now I want you to get a picture. What I drew in my notes was a car on a hoist. Now the reason I did that was because yesterday I was sitting in the in the in the in a place getting my my tires rotated, my oil changed. And I happened to see them hit a button and my car rose up like somebody was just lifting up with a finger. Bing. And what happens is Boasting is my attempt to vault myself up, pump myself up. To brag about what isn't mine, to brag about my accomplishments, my possessions, my wealth, my achievements, could be even simple things like my, my position or my capacity to be respected or my capacity to speak or my capacity to draw or my capacity to sing or my capacity to do math or whatever it is. I boast about it. But the word boasting there is not just, oh yeah, you know, Randy, I, I'm pretty good at this or that. Boasting is puffing myself up like a puffer fish. You seen them fishes that when they get scared, their throat goes out like that. You seen them? That kind of thing. Puffer. I was trying to think about it. And pride then is my tendency to feel good about my capacity to do things on my own. Pride is my the reality that I have and the tension that I keep that if something happens I blame, I give myself the glory. Actually, what it's vain glory. Pride is my tendency to believe I'm all that. Now, here's, here's what I think happens. I think pride is the noun. Pride is the condition or the disease. I looked in Proverbs, I looked in Psalms, pride is all over the place. Pride is the condition of the disease. Here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to go back to where I can see all the way back. Everybody in the room, when I ask you this question, I want you everybody to raise their hand. How many struggle with pride? Raise your hand, everybody. Now, some of you do pride like this. You're proud. I'm all that. And some of you, I, I'm a Christian, so I got to keep it under the down low. I got to, you know, I'm not going to tell nobody that I'm. So others of you do the reverse of pride, which is negative pride. I say, Mary Beth, you did a nice job. She said, oh, it wasn't nothing. I didn't really work that hard at it. That's the reverse pride. It's an evaluation. 
Pride is my capacity. It's neither positive or negative. It's my capacity to evaluate good or bad and trust my judgment. Does that make sense? My capacity to evaluate good, great, poor, or bad and trust my judgment. Okay. So pride is the noun. It's the condition. And it's the condition we all struggle with. We all battle. Boasting is the verb. Now, here's my question. You could say, well, I don't boast. I don't boast. Joel would say, I don't boast. And then I would ask Joel, do you ever talk to yourself? (laughs) He said, no, 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 I never talk. I'm not going to talk. I don't. Do you ever talk to yourself, Brad? You do. And you say things to yourself. I heard him up there. He was like, I was you out in here, but he was like, I'm killing this bass, man. <laughs> killing this bass, man. Y'all checking me out? I'm killing this bass, man. <laughs> he wasn't really, he wasn't really saying. He wasn't, he, he wasn't really saying it. He gonna kill me afterwards, like, yeah, Jack, I'm gonna kill you. That's what I'm gonna do. All right, I got your bass. Okay. But the but boasting. Okay, so if pride is my evaluation, then boasting is the conversation that goes with pride. Does that make sense? If pride is my evaluation, I'm good, I'm good, or I'm bad, I'm bad, then boasting, loud or quiet, is the conversation that goes with it. And the problem is, boasting and being pride isn't necessarily bad. It's neutral. But when... Your boasting, your pride in your boasting is connected to me. And what's Paul worried about and what's God worried about? God says, I love you and I'm patient and you need me to pull it off. And I'm saying, nah, Lord, you know what? I got this, man. I got this. And then I talk to myself. And I tell myself, yeah, I can do this. I do it every time I come up to preach. I have to battle. Because my perfectionist is, do I got all my notes in order and do I got my PowerPoints and all that? And then I get up here and God says, chill, dude, I got you. And all the stuff I fret about, he lays it out for me. It's already written, like he writes it. Because I'm worried I'm going to forget this point, I'm gonna, it's not going to match the PowerPoint, blah, blah, blah. And then I start talking and I trust him. And guess what? It goes okay. And even if it doesn't, I'm at hope. Y'all love me. I, it's good. You know, it's good. Right? Even if, and, and other times, even if it don't, you don't know what I got written down here. You don't know what I missed. No how. Right? I'm the only one that can go back and go, oh, dude, I skipped three points on that one. <laughs> right? So, so what, what, what I believe is God is patient and kind. He puts his arm around Brett. Puts his arm around him. And he says to him, I know you, Brent, I know you're arrogant. I know it. Randy, I know you. I know you talk trash, too. I know how you talk to yourself, too. But I got you. And this relationship that we have will subdue and change. Because what happens is I start to become pride, starts to be in my relationship with the Father who's patient and who loves me. And I boast, I boast not only in my, the stuff that God does through me, and I say, hey man, look what the Lord's doing. I also boast in the fact that I'm too weak to do it on my own. There are things that I say from the pulpit up here that when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, I told myself I would never say out loud. But the gospel gives me the courage to say in front of witnesses, I'm a sinner. I've messed this up. I've screwed this up. I'm proud. I, I boast. I'm arrogant. I'm lazy. Whatever it is. I got a temper problem. I got depression. I'm an addict. Whatever it is. 
gospel gives me the courage because <laughs> the God, the Father that I love, that loves me first, ain't mad at me. And he doesn't look down. And he's not frowning. Even in the face of my tendency to be a prideful, boastful jerk. I can be who I am in front of him. And what Paul's saying is, love does patience. Love does kindness. To those who are envious, those who are boastful and those who at their character, that one of their character defects is a tendency to be proud. I say this. My idea is this. I understand pride and that boastful condition that follows it to be rooted in some things. Here's what I think. Pride is rooted in worldly mindfulness. Pride is rooted in concerning myself with the things and the treasures and the accomplishments of this world. But it also has an interesting focus. Pride can only exist to the degree that I have an alone focus. Now what I mean by that is Pride can only exist if I fundamentally believe at the core I'm by myself. If I'm by myself and I got to get to heaven, guess who's got to get me there? I was raised in a family where they told me, JC, you're all you got. You're all you got. Don't trust nobody. You're all you got. So I had to develop pride. And I had to be able to present my accomplishments. And when I became a Christian in 1980, I accepted Jesus as my Lord, but I didn't accept him as my Savior. You know why? Because I didn't really need him. I was doing this on my own. I, I, I asked the Lord to be the Lord of my life because I wanted to be connected to him but I didn't need him. He wasn't my savior. I had lots of pride. I think it's even funny that I'm preaching this sermon today. <laughs> God has a sense of humor because he put a knucklehead, braggad, braggadocious dude in front of you today. I'll, I'll finish with, I, when I finish, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll show you a little bit of my Ugliness. Alone focus. But at the core, so what do I have? Pride forces me to look out in the world and say, I want, I want. Can I have, can I have? Boy myself up with whatever it is, respect, acclaim, talent, whatever I think I got to collect to feel good. And I got to remember in my head I'm all by myself. And literally, there are people out there, and I'm, I'm looking at a handful of you. Who believe that too? Now, I became a Christian, and guess what? It didn't go away. My worldly focus didn't go away, and my tendency to believe I'm alone didn't go away. But this relationship we have, uh oh. So, God's relationship is, in God's perspective, is rooted in something different, being heavenly minded and relational in focus. And he wants us to have that perspective too. He wants us to be heavenly minded, which means I enjoy the life here, but I know there's something more. I know there's something richer. I know there's something that sustains me out there, up there. And then he wants us. To not have a focus of being alone, but he wants us to have a focus of being in relationship with a, a father who's committed to us. 
Now, the antidote for pride is adopting and developing and entrusting yourself to a father who's patient with you and who's kind with you and who understands your tendency to envy, your tendency to boast, and your character of pride. And what he promises is that over time, he will transform your mind to becoming more heavily minded, more heaven minded, more kingdom oriented. And he will transform all of us from being so Gullum like, Schmeagol like, my precious oriented. See, the problem why I love that movie is because Schmeagol found his precious and went to a cave and lived with the precious. And he says in, in the second movie, the precious transformed him. He said he forgot his name. So that's what happens. Pride will take you to a cave and you'll stare at what you're proud about and the pride and, the, and what you stare will reflect back and transform you into a beast. Somebody that might bite a finger off. But God says he loves you, and we want to know, I want to say the Father is love, and he's patient and kind, persevering, trusts all, hopes all. And he understands our tendency to be envious, our tendency to be boastful, and our character of pride. And he wants to transform it so that we become more heavenly minded and more relational. Not only relational this way. Now, some of you be careful because I know I got some introverts in here who are going to object to the next thing I do. Relational. See, those of us who are introverts, we cool with God. Yeah, cool. God, you know, yeah, it's just me and you. I'm good. Okay. Then God says, I want you to connect with Randy. Nah, man, you know what? You can forget that, dude. I don't want nothing to do with him, man. I, I, people mess me up. But you know what he's calling us to do in this fellowship is to become friends with knuckleheads. Right? Now, I'm including myself in there. Don't think I'm standing up here like, y'all knuckleheads. I'm not. Become friends with knuckleheads, right? He's calling us not only to have a relationship where he reaches down and, and draws us in, and calls us to him and loves us. But then he's going to compel us to love others. I found out, I pick on my friend Randy, I found out though, I used to think, this dude, man, ain't nothing like me, man. Then we start working on some committees, and then I realized this. He, listen to me, y'all, he says the stuff I think. <laughs> I just don't say it. And me and him, turns out, we're more alike than different. But see, sometimes you let the package fool you. And so God's going to call you to be more heavenly minded and more relational. That means kids getting along with kids, kids getting along with parents, kids getting along with other adults. That means adults getting along with other adults of different flavor and nationality and color and that kind of thing, with the common bond being Christ. Common bond being Christ. Boast and pride. The truth is this, and I'll finish with this, and I'll tell you a little bit of the story. There we go. God's patience and kindness can subdue our tension and our pridefulness and our boasting. God's patience and kindness, his loving, long-suffering, and the kindness as, I, as Mike and I have described it, can subdue, can bring under control. The antidote for pride and boasting is humility and meekness. Write that down. The antidote for pride and boasting is humility and meekness. And you can't learn that 
with a worldly focus and a, with a worldly with worldly mindedness and a lone focus. You can only learn that if you have a heavenly focus and a, a heavenly minded and a and a and a relational focus. You can only learn it that way. Because God, I read the verse. Jesus promises to be humble and meek with us. And he promises in the Beatitudes that part of the character of understanding God's grace and coming to faith through grace is that he will grow in us the capacity to be humble and the capacity to be meek. Now, the, the, the last thing I want to say is the reason this can happen, the reason this can happen is because God is secure. So hit our arrogance and our boasting, our boasting and our turning our back on him and our pointing our finger at him and our blaming him or our God, accusing him of being alone. You ain't been here. I was getting hit by my mom. Where were you? He's secure. Like Mike said, he, he ain't doing the you know, they don't like me. I don't know if I want to be God. That thing he did last time. Ain't, that ain't our father. Our father looks and says, I understand where you're at. You, you can't see me, but I can see you. See, we act like kids. Little kids do this. I can't see you. I can't see you. And, and, and in a little kid's mind, because of the developmentally way they think, when they put their hands over their eyes and you disappear, you're gone. And then when they, that's why when they open their eyes, when you play peek, they start, they're so startled. Because you, where'd you come from? And that's how we are. We get in pain and tension and we, we can't see you. Where you at? And we think it's him. It's us. And then when we open our eyes or he opens our eyes, what? was you there the whole time? You couldn't have been. And he's saying, yeah. Hum, humility and meekness grows out of that relationship. When I become heavily minded and I'm growing in my heavily mindedness and I become relational. Let me finish with this. I'll give you an example of the opposite. If you'd have met me in 1980, you'd have met, well, you'd have met a a thin, in-shape guy, first of all. <laughs> yeah. About 170 pounds. Both knees work. Right? About a, almost, 38, uh, almost a 40-inch vertical. About 38 inches I could jump off the ground. Um, grew up in Denver and played a lot of basketball. Went to a small college. Went to the small college because that was going to be my step into the pros. Now, I think every player thinks this, okay? But my freshman year, when I got done after my freshman year, my coach told me that was true. You got pro potential. Now, that didn't really help my head. You got to understand that. Because I was one of these kind of basketball players that didn't like to play in his home gym. You know why? Because I didn't really care about my fans. And our fans saying, hey, 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 I like to go in somebody else's gym and make their fans mad. And the way I knew they were mad, they would boo me. Boo. And I would do stuff like this to them. <laughs> Bring it, you know. I was, I was so bad that I would go to a game with my team, and I was so cocky I didn't sit with my team. Right? My, even my own teammates would be talking to each other, what's wrong with him, man? <laughs> what's wrong with him? What do he think? I'm thinking, man, I'm way better than y'all, man. Like, it's... Simple. My sophomore year, several times, because the coach didn't buy the hype, and he, he put me on JV, which, <laughs> say that again, you, 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 you feeling that with me, right? I mean, you, you, you brothers, right? That would hurt, right? He put me on JV, so I decided every guard on the varsity was going to pay. So every practice, I made their life. I can't say what I, I, what I did, but I made their life trouble. And several times that, that year before he moved me up to play with him, he'd stop practice. And he'd say, can't you stop Chambers? And I'd be walking behind him saying, tell him no, man. 
Tell him, no, they can't stop me. You can't stop me. He can't stop me. One time I, I played a game, and I was, the, I was always the, the, the player on the offense, the guard on the offense of the other team. And this was a lucky day, but I, I, I was so cocky I thought it was me. And I, I was playing the whole practice left-handed because the guy I played with was the guy that I, that I was supposed to be emulating was left-handed. His name was Eugene Cheatham, and he was cold-blooded. So I was coming to practice shooting left-hand jumpers on him. Coach stopped practice again. He said, can't you stop, Chambers? I whispered to two of the varsity guys, I ain't Chambers, I'm Gene Cheeto, baby. <laughs> That's, that was me. Everything I did from dressing to how I walked, everything was orchestrated to generate pride in braggadocia. So, so, so I become a Christian and things start to change. I start to find out how I'm hurting people. Some of the players who were believers on the team said to me, hey, man, you know what, how you behaved and what impact that had? I said, no, nah, man. And they started to tell me. See, as I start to connect with the Father and become relational, feedback starts to matter. I can hear from other people. And people ask me now, like, you know, you always dress so relaxed, and you always do this. You, 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 don't, really, you don't really want me to try to like, you know, dress up and stuff because it's not going to be pretty. Like, I, I can't do it with any kind of relief anymore. Like, all that stuff went away. I don't want it anymore. I don't want it anymore. I don't want to be looking around and seeing who's looking at me. I don't want to be doing everything to try to get the praise of you guys. What God taught me through this relationship was that it's okay to take, the, take a back seat. And now... My heart aches to promote other people. My heart aches now to grow leaders, to take my spot, to go do your thing. I don't want people to look like me. I want them to find them because in Christ, in that relationship, I found me. And that braggadocious guy, that wasn't really me. That was me puffing myself up. See, pride and bragging is the symptom of insecurity. I didn't know that. I'm a secure guy now, and I don't even have to talk about it. But I'm not always secure. Security comes and goes. But what I'm saying to you is this. God's patience, his kindness, can subdue that and can change it. I tell it to you because when you look at me now, I'm a different guy. I'm surprised because people describe me as humble. That, 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 that brings tears to my It's the very thing I've always wanted. Because I wasn't, there was a time in my life you wouldn't have described me as humble. There was a time. So my challenge to you is this. Remember, love comes from God. And if love comes from God, then he's the author of it. He's patient. He's kind. And he can deal with you. It's easy. Amen? It's easy. Bow in prayer. Dear Father, I just want to say thank you for your patience and your kindness. Thank you for being the author of love. Thank you for loving us and calling us to you. And give us the capacity and give us the wherewithal to begin to trust that you want to love us. And that you are committed to us. And that you will keep your commitments to us even in the face of prideful bragging or envy or any of those other kinds of things. That you are helios and you look at our weakness, weak, wickedness with love and compassion and understanding. And we are so thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen.